I'm OG Ananobi of the Toronto Raptors, and you're listening to the Double Clutch Podcast. Hello there, guys, and welcome to the latest edition of the Double Clutch Podcast. I'm Joe Holbert, hosting for the first time in a very long time, and I'm joined once again. I think it's the first time we've ever just been a pair on ourselves, but I am joined today by Jamie Oppenheim. I'm disappointed in your memory, Joe. We did a couple of season preview shows a couple of years ago together. A couple, oh God, I can't even remember. I've been on so many podcasts that I just, I can't even remember. I, it is tough for you. Your schedule is insane. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's so, so many um, writing, podcasting duties and obviously covering other sports. Just, yeah, it makes my schedule absolutely hectic. Um, how have you been enjoying the playoffs? Because it's the first time your team's been in it. Um, for a long time. I mean, I, I'm very used to my team not being in it, so it's not really any different to me. But I mean, how is it? How has it been in Brooklyn? Uh, it, it does add something special, as NBA fans know who do have that privilege. Um, you always get excited for the playoffs, but it's it's just more fun when your team's involved. You just you want to just talk trash. You just get into the whole thing. You dive right in. It's great. Yeah, I mean, we only had five games in it last year, but the win was still the one win we had. I think it was in game three. It's still the highlight of my Timberwolves fandom, I think. it's. Um, I, I know, obviously, Brooklyn's attendance, as I'm right in saying, were quite low this year. What's the kind of... What's it? Has it done a lot for the area? Is, is it... I mean, it's always vibrant, Brooklyn, I can imagine, but has it... You know, have the locals really bought into this team? You're starting to see it a little bit more. Um, it, it's kind of built, been building throughout this season, which was nice to see. Um, the last time I, I checked for tickets for uh, Game 3, uh, Thursday night, it's like almost $200 just to get in the door. So I, I'd say that's a pretty promising sign. Um, back during the Darren Williams era, you could still get in for, for under 100 bucks for the playoffs. So we're, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, you've got a really fun team, and I, I think we're we're definitely going to be speaking about that game today. So what we're going to do today, we're going to speak about the playoff series. So we're recording this on um, Tuesday evening, UK time, afternoon, for Jamie over in Brooklyn. So we're not going to talk about the games that are being played today, although we may go a little bit into Toronto. Um, but obviously, it, there's no point us talking about the games today, because we could look like massive idiots when this podcast is released we're going to start with the thrilling game from last night that if any of you UK listeners watched live, I am very, very impressed with you. Also semi-disgusted with you, staying up till six in the morning to watch basketball. Um, Jamie, Warriors Clippers, I, I'm i in a couple of group chats on NBA Twitter and when I wake up, it's cool, I always, read, I always go and read back. Pretty much everyone that wasn't a Warriors fan in those group chats, they turned off um, in the middle of the third quarter. So with... I mean, the numbers three and one Hawk Warriors fans, they blew a 31-point lead and they had that 31-point lead on seven minutes and 31 seconds on the clock. A lot of people turned off um, and the Clippers mounted a comeback that had a 0.01% chance. Jamie, talk to me about, about what you saw and how amazing a moment this was for Steve Ballmer's Los Angeles Clippers. Yeah, uh, I had the same experience in my group chats. There's only one person... Uh, and that was Josh Eberly, who claims to have predicted this collapse at halftime. I, I have yet to verify that, but um, I'm equally as impressed with the Clippers' performance in the second half as I am unimpressed with Golden State's performance. And I guess, yes, that makes sense. But in terms of mentality, the Clippers didn't switch off. They didn't, they didn't get rattled. They didn't severely alter the, their uh, mental approach. They just continue to dig in, play their game, Beverly getting into Durant, Williams scoring left and right on offense like he does. Meanwhile, you do have the Warriors who, and they, they kind of turned off, and, and that's why you have these kind of turnarounds. But Clipper performance, that, that was a really strong veteran move by them. Yeah, Patrick Beverly was, I watched the whole game back this morning with a bit, I watched the second half back or the collapse from 7.31. I watched that twice. Um, and Patrick Beverly, the first time I watched it, I thought, oh, this guy's just getting under the skin. But when you watch it the second time, or when I watched it the second time, you realised what he was doing, which was there's a lot of top locking going on, which is where you don't let a guy come around a screen. 
he just got under his skin. And I actually, unfortunately, because I like knowing when the timeouts are, I had to watch the home broadcast, which is the Warriors broadcast, and the commentary was just awful. It was so biased. They were acting like Beverly was doing anything wrong. He, he wasn't. He was, you know, he was probably a little bit over the line at times, but that's no different to what Draymond Green has done, has done over the years. And Andrew Bogut, Andre Iguodala, these are all like physical players. And I think Beverly gave those guys a bit of a taste of their own medicine. What, what did you make particularly of Durant's performance? Because Warriors Twitter is really, I mean, they go at him anyway. Um, Curry and Clay get free passes from that fan base. But Durant seemed to be picked out for being unassertive. If that's a word, I hope it's a word, or I look really silly. But what what do you kind of make of that line of thought? Yeah, I, I don't want to play armchair psychologist on this, but he he just didn't seem engaged, particularly in the second half. Um, he, he wasn't enjoying his experience with Mr. Beverly. Um, he, he looked like he would rather be guarded by nearly anyone else on the Clippers roster. Um, and and the, the stats don't lie. He had, what, nine turnovers? He wasn't moving without the ball. When he did have the ball, he didn't seem to have too much intent in getting to the rim or getting to his spots. It, it was just really lackluster, lackadaisical, uh, lackadaisical effort from Durant. And you could really see the, the tide shift and the offense shift once Curry picked up that fourth foul. Everything started to run through Durant and the whole offense became stagnant. Yeah, that has been a, a theme. I, I can't believe I'm saying this about a team who's just won from three of the last four championships, but that has been a theme for me when Durant has run the offense. He's one of he's there are many who believe he's the most well rounded and gifted offensive player of all time. I don't think you can necessarily put up too much of an argument with that. But when the offense just runs for him, it does revert to the ISO ball, which is not the back screen ball movement heavy offense they had when Harrison Barnes was at the four. Um, my my biggest problem with the tape, I pick up on the same sort of things as you, is that I think they didn't have that secondary ball handler. It got a little bit better when they put Sean Livingston in, because even though he's not a shooter, he's um, he gets to his spots, he, he'll move the ball, but the ball was, was stuck, um, and it was not helped by a couple of no-shows um, from, some of, from some of the bench players. But do you think... I mean, I can't believe we're talking about this from a Warriors team, but do you think when Curry is in foul trouble, do you think that's when teams sense their moment to pounce on this team? I think you have to. Not only is Curry obviously a multiple MVP winner, the team still feeds off of him, regardless of the talent that's that's surrounding him. He is still the emotional leader of that team. He is the... Um, the de facto leader, but also the emotional leader. When he's in that mood, when he's in that zone, everybody feeds off of it. So when he's off the court, teams do need to seize on that opportunity to, to make their run like the Clippers did. And what we saw last night was that when Curry re-entered the game, they couldn't just flip the switch again. It, it's not as easy as the Warriors seem to think of it, think it is, if that makes sense, where okay, we could just start bombing away from three again. We're better than everyone else. You, you have to be in that moment and build up to it in, in order to go on those runs, and, and they can't just turn it on in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, I, and, and something I've, um, in your last two answers, something I've picked up on is that you, you used the word lackadaisical. When I was watching the Warriors broadcast, as I've said, I was pretty disgusted by the uh, bias in the commentary. I mean, our teams, Jamie, we're spoilt with the Timberwolves and Nets broadcast. They're like top three or four in the league. But one line he did say it was when Steph Curry turned it over with about four minutes left. And he said, that's the first time all season I've seen Steph Curry know what to do. Do you think that this Warriors team at times, again, I'm critiquing a three-time um, NBA champion, four actually, um, do you think at times they can be a little bit loose, a little bit careless, a little bit out of structure? Because something I saw was that it, it's not the deep threes that bother me, it's the deep threes out of rhythm, it's the fact that they weren't running any actions. There were times when they were just getting Curry the ball off a screen and hoping he did something. For me, that's not how you play down the stretch. And I think it really... Um, 
it um, contrasted with the way the Clippers are playing. Even though it was pretty much Lou Williams' ball, there was more action. There was a little bit more purpose to what they were doing. Yeah, I think purpose is actually the right word here. Um, we, we know that Golden State's whole thing is, again, let's see how many points we can put up. That's where they get their mojo. That's, that's their identity. What we used to see from this team, though, was that there was a lot of purpose in, in those um, in their movement off the ball, even if it wasn't a structured set. Um, Curry and, to a lesser extent, Clay Thompson, these guys are shot hunters. They are looking for something specific, and they're trying to find out the best way to get it. What we're seeing now is less intent. They're just looking for an open look instead of the right open look. And it, maybe there's some semantics involved there. It's just not the same level of crispness that we're used to seeing from this Warriors team. I'm with you. They play like they would play like I would on NBA 2K if I was managing. Um, if I put any five I wanted to, I'm just jacking up three. It's how I play anyway because I'm not very good. Um, again, I shouldn't compare it to a video game, but I think that the the lack of Durant was actually, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here. He wasn't assertive, but I think the way to get over that, they need to run more set plays for him to get him into matchups because if Patrick Beverly is disrupting him, if, if you have, if you lean more heavily in offensive sets, I think you can get around that. You can have more wrinkles, but I think the way that they played, that they played their offense in this guy, I know this got 131 points, so offense may not have been the problem, but I'm talking about when they blew that, massive lead where offense was a was a problem it, it uh, the clippers were hitting them in transition they were getting easy matchups because the warriors had no structure i think the way to get durant back into this game back into this series is to just run a little bit more set plays purpose i think is is the right word to describe all this yeah and, and i'd be down for watching durant come off screens and, and hit quick hitters and quick jump shots and, you know, offense is a problem. You could score 131 points and still have a problem offensively. When you have 22 turnovers in a playoff game, you have a problem offensively. Whether it's the scheme or the system or whatever you want to call it, it's irrelevant. You need to execute in the playoffs or the other team is going to murder you for it. And that's what we saw in the Clippers in the second half. They were getting points off transition. They were just, the Warriors were just gifting them points. Yeah, they were, and, and two of the players who really shone for me, we've spoken about Pat Beverly. Obviously, you know what you're getting with Danilo Gallinari. He's had a borderline for me all-NBA impact this year, but the, the guy who impressed me, and he's impressed me all season long, was Montrezl Harrell. I think there's all this talk about how Clippers are going to go after big free agents. I think they're going to actually land a couple of them. Um, but Harrell is such a unique mismatch, and something that I noticed in the... Third quarter, when the Clippers started to go on that run, Steve Kerr put Andrew Boga in. Andrew Boga, he was better at handling him than Jonas Jarebko was, but he was, um, let's just put it this way, he was not mobile enough to deal with Harold. And I think Harold, though he's got his defensive flaws, he is one of the most unique weapons in this league. And what, what I love about what Jerry West has done is... I mean, this team's good. A playoff appearance is a fantastic achievement. But I think the purpose of this year was to buy, was to get players in who are perfect side pieces for your Jimmy Butlers, Kawhi Leonard's, Kyrie Irving's, those type of players. And Harold, for me, I, I just want to know what you think because I think he turned this game nine for nine from the field, seven for nine from the um, from the free throw line. He shredded them inside and he forced the Warriors to go a little bit bigger than they wanted to. Bogut has still got the right defensive mind that he always had. I don't think he's got the mobility to cope with a player like that. Yeah, and um, last week I kind of joked around with Mike and Matt about DeMarcus Cousins' playing time, and, and I feel bad for that. But I feel bad about it now uh, because of the injury and you feel awful for Cousins. But I genuinely thought that uh, Harrell was, gonna, was really going to cause problems for Cousins on the defensive end. Um, he's just too quick, too athletic, and, and too kind of determined just to get to his spot and, and get to the rim um, where Cousins just doesn't have the athleticism to keep up. And that's only going to be compounded now if you have to throw Andrew Bogut at him. Um, we're going to probably need to see more 
uh, Kevon Looney, and maybe you do throw out Jordan Bell <laughs> and see how that goes, or, or, or go small and see if Igudala has anything for him. But um, Harrell's energy and hustle, it, it's going to be something that the Warriors have to account for, and it's not something that they want to do in the first round of the playoffs. No, he's gonna he's gonna wear them down. You mentioned the Cousins injury there. Something that interested me in Game One was how the Clippers defended the Draymond Cousins pairing. They just they basically said if Draymond Green and Demarcus Cousins shoot threes and beat us, we're going to allow that. Um, Cousins is one of my favorite players. He has been since he entered the league. I loved what he tried to do more than did in Sacramento. Um, for for this team, do you think this injury? can have, I hate saying this about injured players, but do you think that they can actually get better in some other areas with the other bigs on their roster? I don't think so. Um, Looney is kind of intriguing, I guess, but I I don't think Bell and Bogut, um, Damian Jones, if you're going to give him, I don't think they offer anything substantial. Uh, and certainly not anything drastically different than what you would get from Cousins. Um, I do regard this as, as a pretty big blow for Golden State. They'll probably still win, but this definitely makes it makes their journey tougher. What exactly do you think is the main thing they're going to miss from him? I, I think it's his ability to manufacture points as, a, as another option. Um he does move the ball well at times when he wants to, and that's not something you're going to have. But, but most importantly, th- these other guys, they don't have the experience. They don't have the overall skill set. It's a really tough spot to play with those other four guys. Cousins not bothered by that. But if you're Jordan Bell and you've had the season that you've had, all of a sudden you want the pressure on you? I don't think so. Um, wh- one thing I was thinking, though, in regards to this Cousins issue uh, injury... Do you think it's possible that Steve Kerr's sort of emotional intelligence and how he's always tapped into players' feelings the way that Phil Jackson was, do you think that actually turned into a negative last night where the team was maybe a little bit too sentimental about Cousins getting hurt and too focused on that and not focused on we can't worry about who's not here and, and finding a way to win? Yeah, I do. I, um, I think they played without, without control. And again, the lackadaisical word is the word you use. I think Kerr is, he's created a really good atmosphere at this Warriors team. He's a, you you often see like clips that go viral of him boosting those players. He didn't do it by shouting at them like, you know, a Tom Thibodeau or a Stan Van Gundy would. Um, but I do think that last night, I do think that atmosphere contributed to their downfall. They were too, they were getting too heated after Cousins' injury, Little maybe a little bit too emotional. But there were other times where they just were not running the offensive sets that you need to um, to win in to win in the postseason. Do you think that that massive run that they went on between the second and third quarters contributed um, to them failing to execute down the uh, well in the back half of the third quarter and the fourth quarter? Do you think they just got too loose, like this is too easy, and forgot their fundamentals? Yeah, I think actually. Um, when the Clippers were coming back, it was a slow comeback, by the way. It wasn't like they suddenly flipped it. They were like getting within 10, then it was going down to 15, then they'd get to within 8, and it would go down to 12. It was a slow comeback. And I think it was very much one of those things that those Warriors players are probably thinking, yeah, they're not going to come back. This is a nice run. They're hitting some really tough shots. Jermichael Green, I think, went 5 for 6, and the shots he made, none of them uh, none of them were easy. Lou Williams was hitting like fadeaway mid-range one-handed jumpers they were probably thinking they're not going to come back and they got to a point where they were thinking wow you know we're in some serious trouble here and I think that was that run I talked about when Andrew Bogut came in because he just could not handle uh, big monstrous Harrell yeah and I saw the same thing that you did where you didn't get the feeling that okay this is going to be an extended Clippers run or they're hitting some shots now but um, they, they don't have the ammunition for this comeback and it, they just didn't go away. It was like it, they, were, they were like a zombie. They just kept coming and coming and coming, and eventually they were there and took the lead and won. Yeah, they they really um, just did not lie down. And I was I was really happy to see Landry Shamit hit that 
it was essentially the game winning shot. Great play design. They sent Shea off a um off a slip screen because they knew Lou Williams was gonna get double teamed. They just pick out their shooter in the corner. He already for me is one of the best shooters in the league. Um he was Brett Brown optimized him a lot in Philadelphia, and I just think again we spoke earlier about the Clippers building a roster to go it's basically appeal to guys like Kawhi Leonard to drop everything and and go and join a new franchise in their age 29, 30 year. Um, Shamit is is going to be another one of those pieces for me. Yeah, hit him and Gilgis Alexander are going to be those two pieces. Um, do you think this Clippers team, as presently constructed, can lure a big, a big free agent? Um, let's, let's just say, hypothetically, they take Golden State to six or seven games and really put up a good fight. If you're a marquee free agent, is that going to sway your decision at all? Yeah, definitely. I think, and actually, I think a lot of it is what Patrick Beverly's doing as well. I think that's going to appeal to people. I think he's a guy you want on your team. You don't want him on the opposition team. He's just different. I've never seen a player like him. He reminds me of, um, again, I hate bringing up football, but he reminds me of Roy Keane in the sense that you just don't want, you know, he's horrible to play against because not only is he very good at what he does, He's in your face. And I think they've built this roster. And the, the thing you would use, and again, I hate I hate um, sort of boiling sports down to simple terms, but this team is fiery. And I think this is a very, for me, this is the most attractive free agent um, destination. Why would anyone go to New York? Yeah, you play at MSG. New York, other than Mitchell Robinson, do not have one player who Kawhi Leonard is going to want to play with. Sure, yeah, he'll probably take... He'll potentially take a Jimmy Butler or a Curry with him. But if you go to the Clippers, you've already got guys in place who are going to help you. And they're going to help you now. They're not going to help you in five years. They're going to help you right now. Right. My one concern with that is the free agent status of some of these guys. Um, Beverly's contract is up. uh, And then you also have Gallinari up the following year. Um, So I'd be a little bit wary of that. But... It just feels like this is an organization that's going the right direction, regardless of whether that's true or not. The feeling that you get is, yes, this is a place I want to be. I agree with you on that. Yeah, they've they've been very intelligent and they've not been short-sighted. And that takes me into our next series, which is Sixers Nets. So something that went around after game one was, had Elton Brand been short-sighted, deciding this was the year that Philadelphia had to win a ring after a game one in which they were embarrassed um, I shouldn't really mention Sixers fans booing because Philadelphia fans do that anyway. They, they, it's just what they do. It's yeah, it's it's special. But they were pretty bad in Game One. They were absolutely they had no answer for the um for the Nets wing screen, flare screen, down screen games. They had absolutely no answer for it. But yesterday, Jamie, unfortunately for you, um, Philadelphia Seventy Sixers made some adjustments. What did you make of the way that they responded to their Game One setback? So I think it was a combination of two things. One, um, you did see a lot more intent from Philadelphia, especially after the the, the chippy end to the first half. Um, They they were clear that they were the better team, they're they're more talented, and they weren't really going to mess around anymore. They wanted to send a message to, to the Nets. They did late in that second quarter. And then on the flip side, you did see the Nets fall off a lot. Um, they, I, I don't know how this is possible, but they lost Joel Embiid in transition multiple times. Um, their defensive strategy, which theoretically worked well in game one, where they basically have five guys packing the paint, um, uh, the, uh, the Sixers rather were able to find ways around that. They were bringing um, J.J. Redick off screens up from Simmons, so... It was a combination of really good execution and changing game plan from Brett Brown, but also the Sixers just kind of imposing their will. Yeah, they, I think they powered their way to victory. The, the first half was close, and to be honest, I um, said in one of my group chats that I couldn't believe, I think you were down by one or two at the half. And I I couldn't, yeah, you were down by one. I couldn't believe that was the case. I felt Philadelphia were the better team, but obviously you were shooting more threes. They obviously, it, it's simple mathematics. Your shots were more valuable than the 76ers shots. But the main adjustment I saw was the way they defended Joe Harris. In game one, he, the, the thing is with players like Joe Harris, 
if you just look at the box score, you won't understand what he does to an opposition defense. Because even when he's not hitting those shots, his movement is causing defensive switches, defensive lapses, defensive breakdowns. He's just an absolute nightmare. But what they did, they did something called top blocking, which is essentially where you put your feet parallel to the baseline. You basically stand between the guy who wants to come off the screen and the screener. And what it does is it basically forces them to back cut. Now, a way to beat this is to to hit cutters. I don't think the Nets have the personnel of big men to hit those cutters. I've enjoyed Jarrett Allen, but do you think he's... Do you think he's a good enough passer to adjust, to, to make that adjustment, essentially, to hit these back cuts? Because Joe Harris was marked out of the game by J.J. Redick yesterday. He's not, but I think Kuroks is. Um, I think Dudley and, as we saw late in the game, Rondé Hollis Jefferson could be an actually really intriguing option. Um might not have anything for Embiid, but few players do. That's something they may want to explore just for that reason alone, um, where you do have that extra big man passer who can neutralize um, some of Philly's defense. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to work defensively, but I, I'd be willing to give it a shot at this stage. Yeah, I was just amazed at how taking Harris away, it seemed like pulling the plug out of the bath uh, for the Brooklyn Nets. They were... They were still hitting some shots in the first half. I didn't feel they were necessarily in rhythm. I thought I I felt they were getting a lot of offensive rebounds. The Sixers blew a couple of buckets in in tran in transition that ended up with the Nets going back in transition. Um D'Angelo Russell has been a divisive player. Certainly in our slat chat. I am very much a I'm not gonna use the word hater. I'm a Doubt. I'm a D'Angelo Russell doubter. Skeptic. What have you? Skeptic. Yeah, yeah. That's. I can never think of these words when I'm on, but I'll kick myself <laughs> an hour later. What have you made of the way D'Angelo Russell has played? Because in game one, he did exploit the Sixers' renowned drop coverage, which is where you pre-drop a big in the pick and roll to protect the paint. What have you kind of made of his impact? Has he has he had enough of an impact for you over these first two games? I think he's in a really tough spot. The guy guarding him is twice as athletic and also six foot ten, two hundred and fifty pounds and long. Um, just by size alone, Ben Simmons basically cuts off D'Angelo Russell's entire mid-range game, and that's where he wants to operate. Even if he's not taking shots from mid-range, that's where he wants to be. But you can't do that when you're being crowded by um, you have one guy to your right of you, uh, Simmons, who's six foot ten, six foot eleven. And the guy who's uh, defending the pick and roll, Joel Embiid, is 7-1 and also super athletic. Um, so he's, it, it's going to be up to Kenny Atkinson to kind of find ways to get Russell some, some breathing room to operate. Um, he needs clean looks to get his, get, get his shooting stroke going again. And then he needs to find passing lanes, and he doesn't have that right now. Yeah, I, I, I think what... I think what will decide the game, and I think this is the way to stop the Nets, is if you can stop, and it's hard than it looks, by the way, because the Nets run so many ball screens. I think they use more flare screens than any other team. Flare screens where you essentially free up a, a shooter um, with a wing screen. They they roll off to the outside. They um, We were talking about those top blocks a minute ago, and I said one way to beat it is to just hit the back cut, but another way is if your screeners can shoot... That changes everything because your guys aren't going to sag off. They're not going to pre-sag off into the paint because you can just quite easily pop out to three. Um, Jared Dudley, I think, is going to be the X factor in game three. He's going to be... I'm not going to take a sweeping conclusion from this game because I. it's amazing, but Jared Dudley, I think, is that important for the Brooklyn Nets in this series. I think he is, but I also think we need to step back and remember that we're talking about Jared Dudley here. Uh, he's had an amazing career. He's an amazing presence in the locker room. He's a guy you want on your team. If you're relying on Jared Dudley to be the difference maker in a playoff series, you're probably not going to win. And I think kind of what we saw in the first two games for, for the Brooklyn perspective, 
is everything you like about them in game one and then everything you don't like about the team in game two. In game one, you had Russell, Levert, Dinwiddie just attacking left, right, and middle. Um, you were having guys playing chippy defense, all the things that they can do well in playing smart team basketball. And then game two, you saw a team that was overmatched, which they are from a talent standpoint. So I, I think this is going to be up to Philly to decide who's going to be the X factor. Is Philly going to play reasonably smart basketball, or are they going to let the Nets get the advantage by being able to out-execute them? Do you think Atkinson will abandon... You, you spoke earlier about how this Tom Fibler used to do this. It's, it look, what you've ran in the first two games, it looks like the strong side defense to me, which is where you protect the paint and then you, you don't come out to the perimeter until someone's about to get the ball. Do you think he's going to abandon that in that sort of principle in Game 3? Because I think something that Philadelphia did in Game 2 a lot more was they, they got Tobias Harris at the top of the key. They had him attack quickly because that collapses his own defense, and then that's what, that's what opened up things for J.J. Redick on the screen game. Brett Brown just did a very good job. Um but it's basically what I'm asking is, is do you think Atkinson is going to drastically defend his defensive strategy after giving up 145 points? It seems obvious, but I think some coaches prefer not to panic after one loss. And I'm just interested to see what you think Atkinson will do. I don't think that they are going to change much. Um, if you do change something, you're really going to start relying a lot on Jared Allen, um, particularly one-on-one -on -one with Embiid. And that's not a good recipe for anything. I'd, I'd rather take my chances and have Philly beat you from the perimeter. Just keep the paint clogged. Um, you do need to be careful of that ball screen with Redick and Simmons in particular. I, I think you got to just kind of roll the dice, make them beat you with jumpers, and, and try to outscore them on the other end. And don't forget... This is not a good matchup defensively for Philly either. They don't like the high pick and roll. They hate it. Brett Brown even said it before the series began. Like, this is a terrible matchup for us. So I think you need to just play to your strengths. And if you're going to win, have your strengths beat their strengths. Yeah, I, I think the thing that, that has amazed me is that we're talking about a Brooklyn Nets team that are completely outmatched in talent. And we're actually talking about ways they can win this game. When you look at what's going on over in... Um, over in Milwaukee in that series. Um, we're not talking about how Detroit can win the game. This is Kenny Atkinson has made this a lot closer than it should be on paper, in my opinion. Um, I agree that ultimately, though, it is a bad matchup. They were running, they were sticking to that pick and roll. There were a couple of um, D'Angelo Russell, Joe Harris pick and rolls, which I just found. I'm sure you do them a lot in the regular season, but to me, who wasn't an avid watcher of the Nets, in the regular season. That was just amazing for me. Yeah, and I, I get the idea where you want to have as much skill involved in the pick and roll as possible, especially um, when you're not able, when your bigs aren't able to get free at all. Um, we did see a couple moments in the second quarter where Allen had some, had some success, but a lot of the success in the regular season came from Allen and Karuk's getting free off of the pick and roll action. Nets right now, they're, they're kind of forced to try to manufacture it elsewhere. It's not the prettiest offense that, that we've seen. Talking about execution, you brought it up. Are we kind of starting to see a little bit of a shift in this series in particular, but also a little bit in Golden State and a little bit with, with Orlando, Toronto, where teams can sort of counteract a opposition with a top-heavy roster by just being more in sync and um, playing better team basketball. We saw a game one with the Sixers where they didn't really know what they wanted to be doing. Nets did. Nets had a game plan. They were able to stick with it. Is this sort of the antidote to the super team now where lesser talented teams can, can sort of punch above their weight class by being more cohesive? Yeah, I think there's... I think... I, I think that teams like the Nets, the Magic, these Midland playoffs, I think they lean more heavily on offensive sets, offensive plays. I felt Philadelphia in game one, well, no, I didn't feel, I saw it was a fact that they were basically just giving the ball to Jimmy Butler or a 50% fit Joel Embiid and asking him to go to work. 
And the Brooklyn Nets, I think, played on that because they knew when they were coming down the court with that ball, they knew exactly what they wanted to run. It seemed to me like Philadelphia were always kind of looking around at each other, going, okay, well, you know, what actions are we running? And it was the same in the in the Magic Raptors game. The Magic, I mean, Steve Clifford, for me, runs the best sets in the NBA. Someone's going to come at me with the offensive rating. Please look at his rosters he's had. Um, his, his, his best player he's coached is Kemba Walker. So those teams and the Brooklyn Nets say Atkinson's also top five in X's and O's as well. Um, I think these guys playing that team ball, you don't necessarily, you don't see that from teams like the Sixers and the Raptors. Yeah, and I kind of came into this rebuild skeptical of the whole culture and chemistry talk that the, the Nets were big on it. They didn't have anything else that they could market. So they, were, they just went all in on culture. I still think it's overrated, but I also think that what we've seen so far in the playoffs is that it it can kind of gloss over some talent deficiency. Knowing what the, your teammates can do and knowing what you want to do and everyone being in line, it really does make a big difference. And it's not something that we talk about enough. We've seen it with previous super teams too. We've seen it with Cleveland. They, they were poorly constructed with LeBron. They didn't really always have a great idea of what they wanted to do. They just wanted LeBron to create something. That's not a great strategy, especially in the playoffs. And I think this is going to lead to not only a more competitive league, I think that we're going to see even the top teams learn something from this and become even better. So what what exactly do you think the top teams are going to learn? What do you think they're going to adapt to and change to? I think maybe instead of going, well, we need three Hall of Famers, they might say, we're really good with these two guys. We also have a couple other younger players that we can develop, and we have a little bit more cap room. Let's try to build a, a team where we can have eight or nine interchangeable parts. I think I, I think that's the right direction for teams to start going in. What do you think? Yeah, I think teams now, and I, I think I said this to you in the DM earlier before, but it's about now finding the right balance between on-ball and off-ball players. And I think that's where I was talking about the Clippers earlier. If they do add stars, they've got guys like Landry Shamit, Patrick Beverly, Shea Gilles Alexander, who can do really cool, creative things off the ball. I think that, for me, is the main difference. Teams now are drafting and finding these side pieces, whereas I don't think they were before. I think they were either drafting defensive specialists or they were drafting guys they projected could be, you know, your Jamal Crawford's inefficient sixth men, but they, you know, they look good because they can they can run isolations. I think I think it's a really good point you make. And I actually think that it's been a real surprise. I know it's only um one or two games into all these series, but I have been really surprised by how competitive the lower seats have been. Because I follow all the American sports and NFL, Twitter, MLB, Twitter, all they joke about is how bad the NBA playoffs are. But we've they've definitely felt a little less lopsided this year. Yeah, I agree. And it makes for it's just more entertaining. Forget about like the you know, knowing that the Warriors are gonna win. When you see young teams that you can kind of relate to and root for and have something cool going on, um, you you want to see them succeed. So, just just having more balance and not and not having the playoffs just be about some kind of coordination or one really exciting finals matchup. It's it's better for the league. It's better for the fans, and I, I think that kind of diversity is. I don't I, I don't want to make this prediction, but I can see the NBA is surpassing the NFL, which is the king of, of league-wide parity. I can see this kind of trend that we're starting to see help the NBA get to that level. Yeah, I, I, I mean, and I also actually think that the new draft, do you think the new draft lottery can have an effect on that? I want to say yes, but I think it's still going to come down to teams having terrible ownership and, and management it's always the same teams. Um, I know Sacramento is finally starting to get out of that rut, but um, the Knicks are always terrible. The Suns are always terrible. It's always the same teams. So I don't know if it's going to be lottery reform that fixes it or owners just getting smarter and either getting out of the way or hiring the right GM. Yeah, I think one of the problems that the NFL has, and I, I, 
I mean, I might be naive here. You might tell me off here. I don't think the NBA is as much. Well, no, it's not as much of an old boys league as the NFL is. I mean, some of the some of the gems and coaches in the NFL. I mean, Pete Carroll, the coach of my NFL team, the Seattle Seahawks, he gets praised because he teaches his players how to tackle. Like, why are we praising people for that? It's like praising Greg Popovich because he teaches a player how to shoot. That should be a given. I think the standard of coaching and and again, bar those teams you just mentioned, executives is so much higher in the NBA than it is in the NFL because I think there's more of a reliance on analytics and challenging conventional thought. I think the three-point revolution has helped with that, even though you get some coaches who have refused to adapt, but they're not in the league anymore. The Frank Vogels, the Stan Van Gundys. Um, been a bit harsh on Stan there, actually, because he actually started that revolution. Mm-hmm. But you know what I mean? I think, I think those teams... And I think the way the NBA is going, I think it could overtake the NFL because I think it's more progressive. There's just more. They're looking at ways to make themselves better rather than just leaning on, oh, we're going to out, we're going to do things the way we've always done it, but we're going to do it better than other guys. I think the NBA is going in the right direction. And the way that the magic played on Saturday night kind of really has emphasized my belief in this. What did you see from Orlando that that kind of solidified your thoughts? They won because of great coaching. They didn't win because of luck. They didn't win because of... Uh, they did win a little bit because of ineptitude, but for me, Orlando outplayed them. I don't think Toronto out outfoxed themselves. But the the way they the way they constructed their roster, they don't have an elite offensive player. So what did they do? They brought in good defensive players, guys like Jonathan Isaac, Wes Wundu looks like he could be the next 3 and D guy that the league goes crazy for. And you've got guys like Evan Fournier, but they brought in Steve Clifford and he, so many players, so many coaches that would have inherited a roster like that. It was a mess. I don't think anyone had this team in the playoffs outside of Orlando Magic UK in the off season. I can't think of anyone that did, but Steve Clifford came in and he, it sounds crazy we're praising a guy for this, but he built a team around around the strength of his roster. And him and John Hammond being on that same page, I think it, it just really impressed me. You saw that in game one. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, heading into the season, if you said, okay, the Orlando Magic are going to win 42 games and win game one over Toronto – this isn't the image that you were going to have. This wasn't going to be a team that was built offensively around Nick Vucevic. And um, th- there's going to be a team that was going to be so super long and suffocating and the East was going to be so terrible that they would just kind of grind out wins and it was going to be awful to watch. It's not really the case. Like This is a team that's got some nuance offensively. It's, it's not all about Isaac and Gordon and Mo Bamba who can touch two ends of, of each side of America when he stretches out his arms. They're actually playing really good basketball. They're even getting guys like DJ Augustine to... I mean, DJ Augustine slaughtered Kyle Lowry. He did. He absolutely slaughtered him. Guys like Evan Fournier, don't Google his name. I have to say that every time I mention his name. But they just... To me, I think teams like the Suns... And if I'm Robert Sarver, um, the Phoenix Suns, I'm looking, I, I know Orlando are in the East, that makes it a lot easier, but I think a lot of bad teams now are going to take a little bit of inspiration from this Orlando Magic. I want you to tell me if you think I'm going a little bit too far there, but this team, it was dead end for years. Rob Hennigan is one of the worst GMs we've had in this league. He signed about 14 centers. It was a mess of a roster, but, but instead of tanking, instead of just throwing everything on the trade machine, they improved internally and they built an identity out of nothing. For me, if I'm the owner of the Suns, the Knicks, less so the Knicks because I think they, they're going big and free agent, if I'm the Suns, the Kings, the Timberwolves, those terrible organisations, I'm looking at Orlando for a little bit of inspiration. Yeah, I think Orlando and Brooklyn both um, are setting a, a I don't. it might not be the highest bar, it's, it's a different bar, though, in terms of rebuilding. It's You don't have to go crazy in free agency. You don't have to go crazy um, with the process and the draft. Yes, Orlando's had their share of lottery picks. 
nobody that they've drafted was projected to be a superstar, though. They, they missed out on all the top picks. It's, can we build a, a culture and a roster from the ground up? It's going to take a little bit of time, but can we instill an identity in a team and develop our players to the point where, yes, they can make it to the playoffs and get us in position to maybe add that one piece that then gets you over the top? Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, I'm that, that to me seems like what Orlando are going to do. John Hammond did that in Milwaukee. He hit on the Giannis pick, but before that he had drafted some other pieces. The roster looks very, very similar. Now, saying that you're going to find um, Giannis, at, they're probably going to be picking it between 60 and 20. But I, I still admire the way the Magic have gone about this. and And, I mean... It feels like I'm repeating myself, but I've just been amazed by the transition. And their opponents, the Toronto Raptors, Jamie, you wanted to ask me a question about this team and and their setup. You know, do you want to send that yeah. one over to me? So th- there's, I, I don't know if this is, this is exclusive to one of my Twitter chat, and I can't. We're, we're giving a lot of love right now to our Twitter group chats. We sound like the biggest nerds on the planet. Um, <laughs> Um, there is the, a prevailing thought that maybe Toronto actually is snake bitten, and they, it, choking is ingrained in their basketball culture for the for the Raptors. Do you buy into that? I mean, this is a different team than, than what we saw a year ago. They got Kawhi, they got Marcus Sol. Are, are you buying into anything like that? Could that be happening right now? N- no, I think Orlando in Game One. As much as I've just praised them, they shot 14 for 29 from the perimeter. I just, that, that's 48%. Nearly fifth. That's, I'm not sold. That's sustainable. But what did worry me was the way Marcus Gasol played. He was absolutely awful at playing, at playing that pick and pop game. And I think in the modern NBA, that's an absolute no go. So to answer your question, um, I don't think it, I don't think it's built into them. I think, though, I think it's built into the crowd. I think that crowd fear the worst in every playoff game now. Um, I, But I, I still think they'll win this series in five. That was my original prediction. I just think too much went right for Orlando in game one. But the centre rotation for Toronto worries me more so than any voodoo. Yeah, I'll buy that. And as fun as Orlando has been over the last two months... And as much as I'd like for that franchise and that city and that fan base to succeed, right now is Toronto's time. I do want to see them turn this around and put together a real playoff run. I want to see them get to Milwaukee. I don't think they can beat Milwaukee, but I want to see them give it their best shot and put up a respectable showing. I I think that the, the franchise is there. It's now or never. Let's see it happen. Yeah, my, my worry in a Milwaukee Toronto series is I just don't think Toronto will have an answer for Brooke Lopez. But then counter argument is I don't think I don't think anyone's had an answer for Brooke Lopez. I'm surprised that you went with Brooke Lopez and not Giannis there. I mean, Giannis, no one can stop that guy. <laughs> you know, he is he's slaughtering anyone, but the pick and pop has just they could not defend it. I know Vucevic only went Vucevic I think shot yeah, three fourteen. He kept popping, and it was opening stuff up elsewhere, which is why I don't always just look at the bot score. But I am going to um, talk about the bot score now. Jamie, Kyle Lowry. I um, <laughs> Again, in one of my group chats, someone put, oh, Kyle Lowry didn't play that bad despite the zero points, <laughs> and he got absolutely roasted in this group chat. Now, I had a bit of sympathy because I think you can still put up zero points and actually have an impact in a positive way. Where do you sit on, because a lot of people are bashing him, that that viral video of that kid led on his bed just laughing about how bad Kyle Lowry is and the playoffs has, has resurfaced. Where do you sit on what Kyle Lowry did in that first game? So I think if you look past going over seven, and if you look past getting torched by DJ Augustine, Uh, on the defensive end, you can make an argument that Kyle Lowry was probably the best player on the floor, but only if you look past those two things. (laughs) Um, No, you're the point guard, you're the leader, 
this can't happen. You, you've got to be the one setting the tone for this new, uh, it's not really an era of Raptors basketball, but it, it's, it's a new team. You've, it's got to be on you, and he failed in that regard. Regardless, if you want to say that, oh, the box score lies, no. You're the team leader. You've been there the longest. You're the point guard. You've got to get your team ready for this game. Yeah, I mean, uh, and the Raptors Twitter, which I rate as one of the smartest, actually. I follow a lot of Raptors writers. It's... Is that because they're Canadian and not American? Is that an America joke? <laughs> they're very polite, <laughs> um, Raptors Twitter. But one of the things that kind of, they were, I don't want to say being apologists, but that's kind of the best way to put it. They were saying, oh, he had impact. You know, he, he ran the offensive sets. For me, any point guard in the postseason should be able to run an offensive set. That should not be seen as a positive and a reason that he didn't he didn't play badly. He lost his defensive assignments. He put up zero points. Sometimes it, sports are not simple. I mean, people like to think they are, but they're not. But there does come a point when you've got to look at zero points and go, actually, hang on a minute. Yeah, he got eight assists. But zero points. He has failed in the... And this is the most simple bit of analysis... I have ever done on this podcast. He did not score any points, which is the objective of the game. And if he'd if he'd scored four points, if he'd hit two layups, they would have won the game. Yeah, and and you don't want to oversimplify it, but at least I was always taught growing up that when a team really needs a bucket and they can't get anything going on offense, the responsibility falls on the point guard. The point guard's got to find a way to get a bucket for himself. Lowry didn't do that. If he had done that twice, as you said, different game. If he did it once, it's probably a different game. He just didn't have it in him. And it's that's the thing that's going to have to change, whether you believe in hoodoos, curses, whatever else. Lowry has got to show up. He's got to get over that mental block, and he's got to do it very, very quickly. Um, w- with regards to with regards to this team for the rest of the series, and and notably Kyle Lowry, do you still believe Toronto ultimately turned this one round? I think they win this series. I'm not convinced that their ability to make it out of the second round. Um, I don't like that matchup against Philly. Does, does, um, does Nick Nurse worry you at all? Because when I look at the rosters, now I've just said that Orlando had a lot go right for them. But to Steve Clifford's credit, he made those things go right, if that makes any sense at yeah. all. It wasn't like he just got a couple of lucky breaks and ran with it. Steve Clifford absolutely blitzed this Raptors defense with that pick-and-pop game. I know that sounds weird because they only put up 104 points. I'm talking about the rhythm of the game. They hit a lot of shots that were sucker punches, notably in that fourth quarter. They just, and I don't know if this is a personnel thing, but Marc Gasol should not have played 32 minutes in that game. He was just getting pulled all over the place by Nikola Vucevic. And my worry all year with Nick Nurse, I think the offense has been pretty basic, to be honest, which is fine. Um, fine in the regular season, but I'm I'm worried as to how far they can go with him as their coach. He's not got much playoff experience. He's not even got much playoff experience um, sitting on a winning team's bench. I'm just, I'm worried as to his adjustments. I think that's a valid concern. I also think that there's some rigidity in this roster. You have a lot of guys who are kind of set in their ways, who play one way at this stage in their career, whether whether because it's their age or they've earned it, if you're Kawhi Leonard. I don't see this being a situation where you can convince the entire locker room, okay, we're going to switch up how we do things now. I don't think that's a message that's going to go over well. You do need to kind of stay the course, you know, run the stuff that got you there and hope that you execute well enough to to get you to Milwaukee and potentially to the finals. Yeah, I I agree. The rigidity is really interesting because I'm looking down the, um, I'm looking down the roster now and you're right. Most of these guys have a set position, which just isn't, it's not too much of a thing anymore. Positions are not seen as mattering. Like Philadelphia's point guard is six foot 10. He's, you know, built like a power forward. Uh, just Toronto, do, do you think that might go against them, the rigidity of the positions on this roster outside of Ananobi and potentially Siakam? I, I, I'm not sure they've got much to do where they can sort of 
you know, change things up, go a little smaller. I think what you see is what you get with this team. Yeah, I agree. This is a what you see is what you get. Um, and I think beyond the ability to play those, play different positions and play different style, you've got veterans there. You've got veterans who have accomplished a lot in their careers. Are they, how are they going to feel about pulling a 180 uh, in game, at game 84 in the season? That's not a message that a coach can really send. So I, I, I just think that all kind of playoff adjustments, it's just going to go against them right now. Um, and, and they're going to have to win through um, veteran experience and execution, which is the big word come playoff time. Yeah, and I also think that message is going to be even harder for a first-year coach with very little experience and I don't want to say respect because that's a bit mean, but around I'm talking around the league. Like Kenny Atkinson's been in the league for a long time, for example. Ditto Steve Clifford. Uh, Nick Nurse has bounced around a lot. He's got all the teams he's coached on the inside of his jacket, which ESPN did a uh, a really cool video on. But yeah, that this has been an interesting series. This is the one I'm looking forward to most, to be honest, because Toronto have a have a knack for collapsing. Uh, we'll go on to the last series. I don't want to spend too long on this because I can safely say that game one of the Indiana Pacers Boston Celtics series was the worst game of basketball I have ever watched in my life. Yeah, I think you're probably a little bit too young to really um, relive the glory of the post-Jordan years. That was some dire basketball, even to the point where Dave Stern criticized it routinely. That was that was bad basketball. Um, neither team really showed much ability to, to score. It wasn't really that great defense. That that was that was bad offense. God, it was being harsh on Boston. I guess they won the game, um, but I mean they were hardly and they've hardly convinced me all season. But the paces when Thaddeus Young got in that foul trouble, it was it was curtains. You know, Bojan Bogdanovic, um, one of my uh, least favorite NBA writers, had him in his All NBA third team, which is uh, very funny. But, I mean, in fairness to Bogdanovic, he is the only shot creator. And he's not even a shot creator for me. He's been at his best for Indiana, attacking off screens. Um, They don't run the most modern offensive sets under Nate McMillan, but he's one of the guys who kind of makes them work. But they just had nothing. They were relying on this Turner-Sabonis pairing that was stiff, is the word I would use. There's no mobility on either end of the floor. Certainly the offensive end, they were just too slow to get around. They did not They did not test Boston at all. No, ag- agreed. And you're, you're dead on with Bogdanovich. He's not a primary shot creator. Where he's able to create shots is as the secondary ball handler in, in a set. So um, if the ball is being swung around the perimeter and he's got to step on his defender, that's where he can shine. He's not going to shine when you have a set defense that can key in on him, and you're, you, Indiana just doesn't have another option, though. And you almost want to throw out uh, Edmund Sumner and just see what he has. He's the most athletic guy in the roster. Maybe he can create a shot. I know he hasn't played much. Um, he was injured for most of his rookie season. You have to try something at some point in this series to, to get some sort of shot creation. Otherwise, you're not breaking 80. <laughs> No, I know, and I, I think I really cre- I laid into Nate McMillan the slack chat. I'm sure you saw it because they were running, they kept running these dribble handoffs. I think there was one stretch of that third quarter where they scored eight points. I think they ran like seven possessions in a row, which were a dribble handoff from Sabonis to I believe it was Wes Matthews coming from the left corner. I don't well, no, I not if they didn't score a single point on those possessions, but. I, f- I mean, Pace's Twitter is another one I follow a lot of. They're really going in hot on Nate McMillan. And personally, I wouldn't. But I'm I'm kind of with you on Edmund Sumner. I'm even looking at, at um, you know, getting more minutes for guys like TJ Leaf. They need to do some because that Sabonis-Turner pairing had, an, had a net rating of minus 60. You, you cannot lean on that against a team like Boston, especially with a guy like Aaron Baines. If you want to attack Aaron Baines... You get him out on the perimeter. You attack him when he's in drop coverage. You don't send two 
back to the basket bigs in a horn set because it's just you're not going to move him. It's he has got to get creative. Name McMillan, and as much as he's my coach of the year vote this year, but I I wouldn't call him creative. Personally. No, and he and he did a, a really remarkable job holding this team together without Oladipo. It's a super limited roster. Um, if you look at guys like TJ Leaf and Doug McDermott, the and to a, a lesser extent of bonus, but they're they're basically redundant pieces. Like they're not. There's no added um, dynamic there. So he he does need to play a certain way, but you're going to see a point where they have to just throw everything at the wall and see if something can stick. Yeah, and to be honest, I, I'm, I just don't think he's going to do it, Jamie. I think he's going to stick with the same rotations. He's one of those old-school coaches um, who's got those sort of hockey line rotations where you know they're the same pretty much every game, barring someone scoring a crap ton of points off the bench um, or an injury. Yeah, for this Indiana team, it, I'm with you. He's held this team together, but this is not a playoff series I'm really looking forward to go back and watching. We spoke earlier about kind of roster construction and how teams are going balanced now, balancing on-ball and off-ball threats. I just don't think this team has enough on-ball guys. I think they were hoping Tyree Evans would kind of be that guy, but he is probably the biggest free agency bust from, from last summer. Yeah, but he did have a hell of a resurgence last year, so go Tyreek. Yeah, I've always been a fan. First jersey I ever owned was a Tyreek Evans Sacramento Kings jersey. God that's, knows that's why. A good jersey. It is. It's it's their old style one as well when they still had the um the crown on the writing. Oh, I love it. I wear it quite often. Um, feels like a good place to end the podcast there on Tyreek Evans. Um, have you got anything you particularly want to add or any predictions for to, for tonight's games? Um, Giannis really good at basketball. That's analysis. That's all I got. Yeah, the only thing I've got, I'm interested to see the the Spurs in game one. They tried to make Jokic a passer, so they basically did not want him shooting and rolling to the basket, but Jamal Murray was awful. Gary Harris was awful. I'm interested to see if the Spurs stick with that strategy, because basically the reason the Nuggets lost that game was because they missed shots, not because Jokic choked or was outplayed. Um, It's been good to have you on, though. It's been great joining you. Yeah, this is a this is a good pod. I can feel it. As always, our website is looking pretty good at the moment. We've got a new feature um, that's just been designed by Hugh Hopkins, which is where we look at playoff matchups. We um, it's basically quick fire responses on some questions. It's a good way. It's a good way to just get some cards out, but also to to improve your NBA minds as well. So check out our website. And I personally will be having. Four. I'm sure you're really looking forward to editing some of these, Jamie. I bet you can't wait. But I've got four draft shows hopefully coming out. One where I look at guards, one where I look at wings, and one where I look at bigs, and then we're going to do a mock draft, hopefully the night before the draft. So, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Um, it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from Jamie.